cryptography broadly is the practice and study of techniques for secure communication in the presence of adversarial behavior. Um, so, you know, do you have information? Do you want to keep it a secret? How do you keep it a secret? Um, is, you know, is kind of the, the pipeline. The way we know something is secure, if I wanted to, you know, prove it to you, if I wanted you to like, not just take my word for it, that if I tell you something is secure, um, you'll have to do two things. First, we have to define an adversary um, or in combination with an adversary, we have to define what's called a security model. So this is a set of basically just mathematical op operations. And these mathematical operations rigorously define everything that the adversary is allowed to do. So maybe they're allowed to look at messages before I encrypt them. Maybe they're allowed to, to look at, you know, some encrypted messages, and then they're allowed to see uh, the decrypted version. And there's all sorts of different behaviors and scenarios that you can define with math in order to model different types of adversaries that would model different scenarios where you'd want to protect information. And so once you've made all of these mathematical definitions, you construct a communication protocol. So this is a mathemat this is a series of mathematical operations that model uh, multiple people talking to each other, sending uh, messages, uh, which consists of just bits back and forth between each other. And once you've defined that protocol, you mathematically prove that the adversary cannot break your protocol. So you prove that they can't uh, learn information, basically. And so the techniques to do this can be can go from very simple to just proving it's hard to div to figure out like the factors of a number um, to extremely complicated problems that like you know people would study you know for like their PhD topics um, or something. So I'm not going to really go into any specific construction, but I do just want you to guys to understand the process of we mathematically construct um, an adversary that tries to break our to, that tries to break our code, and then we prove that they can't break it. And so just to give um, an example, um, this is a high level view of what's called end-to-end -end encryption, which is how you would communicate some, with someone securely over a, over a chat application like WhatsApp or Signal or Facebook Messenger. So every time you use WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, and you talk to someone, this process is occurring with these mathematical key exchanges, encrypting messages, sending encrypted messages, decrypting them with certain keys. Um, and we start with like a high level description of this process, and then we work our way down, getting more and more specific with, um, with the math. And, you know, I just said, you know, we have to prove uh, that are, you know, our adversary, which I've called A here. So we have to prove that adversary A can't break our scheme. And the way that we do these, uh, these mathematical proofs, because I'm not going to really give you an example, um, just because I don't want to like throw, you know, math at you, is that you use A, you use the adversary we made, um, this mathematical uh, set of operations that we consider to be like enemy behavior and you use it to solve a problem you know is hard so you have an adversary you have a problem that you know for a fact is hard or maybe even impossible and you prove that if the adversary exists and can do damage to your like if it can break your code you prove that you've actually solved the problem you knew that was hard and so this is a contradiction. We are saying that, you know, I have this problem I know is impossible and I have a solution to the problem that doesn't make any sense. So that means that like the abilities that I said that this adversary had um, in order to like solve, um, in order to break our encryption, to break our code, um, it can't exist. Um, and so one another way of phrasing this is that we assume that whatever communication protocol or encryption scheme we were making is weak against the adversary. And then assuming that weakness, we are able to build a solution 
to a hard problem B. And kind of the simplest hard problem that um, I'll give you guys as an example um, is determining the factors of number of really, really big numbers. Um, so if I give you a really, really big number and I ask you to pull out a specific like prime factor, um, so a number that divides that number, um, this is a this is a problem that is um, in in theory hard to solve, um, at least on a normal computer. Um, and by hard here, I just mean it takes a long time. So um, unless you have a very special type of encryption called information theoretic encryption, um, you can eventually break any code or any encryption scheme. However, if it takes a really long time, uh, no one is going to break it. So it's you know it's safe enough for human for like humans for human use. Um, and how long it might take to break it uh, might you know allow you to use, different encryption schemes that are maybe faster or slower for different purposes. So, you know, encrypting your bank account transactions, for example, is probably more important than like your Snapchats with like your friend, or maybe I don't know what you send to, maybe you're sending your bank transactions on Snapchat, but you know, maybe don't do that. Um, but if, you know, we basically want like, we want harder and harder problems uh, to solve like and protect more and more secure information. And I know this might seem a little abstract to you guys. So just um, to think about it in terms of the Python code that we've been working with the past two weeks, um, one way to think about this is that we use the adversary A like a Python function. So we have a Python function that is our adversary. And if I give that adversary some data, it will spit back the answer to a really, really hard problem. Um, a problem that I know is too hard for it to actually solve. So I know that this, that this, you know, this function uh, doesn't actually exist. It's not real. Um, and if I know it's not real, then I know my system is safe. And just to like reiterate this idea of contradiction, um, you know, here's a little Phoenix, right? You know, if we have a clear contradiction between the existence of an adversary and the and the hardness of a problem, one of them has to be wrong. And if we already have a proof for the problem uh, that's supposed to be hard, I know it's I know it's the adversary, and I know that my system is safe. How does that intersect with machine learning? So there's two forms that I think are good to consider. Um, one is more theoretical and one is more practical. So first, um, our cert we can think about doing cryptography with machine learning. And so what I mean by this is, you know, can I use a machine learning problem in a, crypto in a cryptography scheme? So if I have a really, really hard machine learning problem, maybe I can use that problem to hide information because the problem's just too hard to solve. And so that's a more theoretical problem um, where we're like building, you know, encryption schemes. Um, on the other hand, more practically, um, machine, your machine learning system that you might build for, you know, any reason is using data sets, right? You're, co you're usually collecting data um, in a, like a supervised problem or an unsupervised problem. And that data might need to be secured. It might be really sensitive. Like maybe you're trying to do like cancer diagnoses. Well, if you wanna do real cancer diagnoses, you have to have databases from hospitals. So hospitals have to actually give you like patient data um, and you have to keep that data secure. You have to make sure no one leaks it. Um, otherwise, you know, you're violating basically the Hippocratic oath that you know all, that like this hospital is uh, is legally obligated and you know morally obligated um, to keep safe, and so we have this theoretical view and this more practical view, and so you know view one again doing cryptography with machine learning. If some problems are not easily learnable, they're really good for cryptography, and on the other hand, if um, you know, maybe the security of a cryptography scheme is not exactly clear. So maybe there's a problem that I think is hard and that I'm using for a cryptography scheme, but I don't really know it's hard. Well, the thing that really decides how hard it is is whether you can learn anything about it. So if I have a problem I'm not quite sure is hard, I could try 
doing machine learning on the on the scheme on the problem and if it finds anything then i know that this problem i was considering was hard is actually um there's some issues with it um so you know i can use cryptography i can use machine learning to try and build a cryptographic scheme or i can use it to try and break one um now uh using it to build uh, crypto, uh cryptographic schemes is very well understood um one way to think about it is that if you have a learning problem, if you have something you want to do machine learning with that is inherently unpredictable, then it's inherently unlearnable. And so, you know, if you can construct this learning problem that you can't solve, then it's good to use for cryptography. And um, some examples of this might be like learning a like um, a perfectly like random uh function so if i like am just sending numbers to random numbers there's no pattern in that i can't like i can't learn anything so i could use that to make certain cryptographic schemes um on the other hand i am not really even though people regularly publish research on this i'm not confident that throwing machine learning at um at like cryptography schemes you're not sure is are secure is necessarily that useful to do um it kind of breaks you know, the mathematical rigorousness um, or the mathematical rigor that I was saying we need earlier. Because if I throw a neural network at a machine at a or at a cryptography problem and see if the neural network can just like figure it out. So the neural network's like acting as the adversary kind of. Um, I don't know really how that network works. So I don't really have a mathematical proof um, in the sense of a proof that I can like read and understand for like why my scheme was broken. The network just kind of figured it out um but people do you know do try and do this and in practice on real schemes that are like running on systems this can also help you find actually bugs um so if you have a bug in your scheme um you know machine learning might be able to pick up some statistical pattern you wouldn't see by hand and just to give you know a concrete example of why this like matters um Here's um, here's a kind of a visual of the um, advanced encryption standard, which like you don't need to know how it works. I just want you to think that um, that it's basically like a really really good and complicated cipher for substituting letters with other letters. It's like you know the Enigma machine. This is like the mathematically secure Enigma machine. This one actually works, um, and so AES um is what is called a block cipher um and block ciphers although we have very good reason um to believe are like very secure and even secure against like quantum computers um we don't actually have proof uh we don't really have explicit proofs for why these ciphers um are so secure we think that it's because they model random like basically just a totally random function well, but there is not a proof for this. And so you might think, you know, maybe if there is something like statistically significant in like across AES or maybe a specific implementation of AES that maybe has a bug in it so it doesn't work the way it's supposed to, you could throw some like machine learning at it and see if it picks up any patterns. Um, and if it does pick up any patterns, it can help you like bug fix if it's an implementation, or it could show that there's some underlying problem in AES that we don't know about. And it, this, you know, if someone actually found this with AES, it would be like earth shattering um, because you use AES hundreds of times a day. You're using AES right now. This video, this video feed that you're looking at, um, I think is encrypted with AES. I don't know if Zoom has fully, uh, Zoom was in the process of encrypting video feeds. I don't know if they've finished, so I don't know if it's actually running right now. But like anytime you use an encrypted video chat, or if you ever go to like the HTTPS version of a site where the S stands for secure, um, all of that is being done with this encryption standard. Um, so it would be, it would be like quite shocking. Um, if it if it ever ended up like being broken, or very reassuring if we actually got you know uh, a proof out of it. On the other hand, we can also think about uh, instead of using ML 
to like either attack or build cryptography. We can think about also how cryptography can help us do ML uh, better. Um, so machine learning often uses sensitive data, as I said, like maybe hospital data, and you got to protect it. Um, and if anyone is interested in this topic more generally, um, the keyword you want to search for is privacy preserving uh, machine learning. And so, you know, why do we even need to think about this? Um, you know, um, so like, why do we even need to think about this? Well, if you have, um, say, like census data, <coughs> um, you and you want to like do some machine learning on the census data, um, you don't want to lose any of the census. You don't want to like accidentally leak information about like a real person census, right? Like a census record in the U.S. Census has tons of personal information about you, right? It has your name, it has your social security number, it has like um, your family that lives with you. Um, it has tons and tons of information in it and you don't want any, any of that to leak. And I have just this little picture of, um, of a census record. And so, you know, the easiest thing we could maybe do is basically jiggle. So I just have this picture of Jello here because um, I, I don't really have a good visual representation of what we're of, of what this is doing besides like thinking of like you know making the data like wiggle a little bit but you know you can think about it uh, about this as like if I changed every single piece of data just a little bit so like I changed everyone's names just a little bit I changed everyone's like um, addresses a little bit I changed everyone's like I changed all the data just a little bit and on the individual level, I can't I can't easily leak anyone's uh, I I can't leak anyone's information anymore necessarily. So like if you looked at one row in the database that like this maybe this is training data was stored in, um, I can't I can't identify who that belonged to eventually because I I, ra I basically randomized the data a little bit, and I say a little bit because if you're very careful you can make it to where the machine learning you would do on the original data still works on this like jiggled data. So even though all the data has been changed just a little bit, you can still compute or you can still do machine learning um, and learn useful things about the entire data set. Um, and those, uh, those things you might learn about the entire data set in the aggregate um, will be uh, still very accurate to how they would have been if I hadn't like jiggled any of the data. So this is called differential privacy, and it's like a huge research topic. It is actually being used in the U.S. Census now. Um, so like you can find um, there were congressional hearings about exactly what mathematical parameters and how to pick them. And, you know, guys from the Census Bureau and were having to like explain to senators why it mattered, um, which there is some pretty funny interactions there. But, you know, this is something simple you can do. And I say simple, in reality, I just mean not cryptographic, it's not cryptography. But it's, um, but it's not, it's not enough. So even though we can do this, um, this differential privacy, um, and like compute some things with a data set, it doesn't actually solve a lot of like, hard problems. Um, that we might care about. So, you know, when I do, you know, when I like jiggle all the data a little bit, I add noise and I get this new secure data set. Um, this data set is now locked. I can't like, I can't change any of the data. I can't figure out if there were duplicates. I can't clean it. So like a big part of machine learning is like making sure your data is in a presentable fashion for like doing the machine learning. Once you've done this, you cannot go back and clean it. The whole data is has been randomized to a point that like I, you can't identify anything um, properly. So like if I delete, you know, if I delete a row of a spreadsheet after I've like you know randomized it, I have no idea if what I deleted was a duplicate or not. I don't know like who it belonged to, and I'm not supposed to. But you know, you could imagine scenarios where you would want to like do this, um, like cleaning process. So there's two things we can do, and I know I am running close um, close on time, so I'm going to wrap it up soon. Um, but you know, we have what's called secure multi-party computation, and I'm not going to explain how that works. But the idea is that you can 
take something, you can take two things, um, you know, you can take some data, you can compute something about it um, that is like supposed to be, that is supposed to be private and you will get an answer back, but you did not have to uh, make the entire data set like you didn't have to jiggle all the data this time. So like, say we have like this scientist, uh, Rhea, I think I got this um, picture from a National Institute of Standards and Technology um, article. And say like Rhea here wants to compute something about, you know, these two different hospital databases. Uh, but, you know, she doesn't want to like destroy the data so she can like modify it if she needs to. You can put multi-party computation in the middle and you are allowed to do that. Um, Another thing you might want to do is you could like compute, uh, do some data, does some data have duplicates? So is some data like replicated in two different like training sets that are maybe really sensitive and you don't want to leak anything about them? And you can do that with a cryptographic technique called private intersection or private set intersection. This was used by Apple and their CSAM system actually, which they almost put on your phones, but there were some issues with it and a lot of backlash and they canceled the project at the last minute. Um, but that's just an example of like, you know, it being present in, you know, in real life. And the system it was being used for was a machine learning system. So it's like extra, extra relevant. Um, and then lastly, I will say, you know, um, even these are like, you know, relatively simple things we wanna do like sub, sub like out like database entries, check for duplicates and stuff. You could imagine you wanna do something more complicated and for that, we have this very, very powerful thing uh, called fully homomorphic encryption, which was discovered um, formally by this guy named Craig Gentry about 11 years ago. Um, he's an inspiration to me because he did not, he was a lawyer and then was like, I wanna do math. So then he got a PhD in, uh, in computer science, sat in a room for like six years and figured this out um, at the age of like 43. Um, so he's a cool dude. Uh, it's never too late to like figure out something you want to do. Um, and so fully homomorphic encryption is like, you know, it's the king in some sense of cryptography. It lets us just give, it lets us encrypt data, give it to someone else, and they can do arbitrary computation. They could do arbitrary, say, machine learning on the encrypted data, and they can give us the results back. And they have no idea what the results are, but we do. We can decrypt it. Um, and so this is super cool. Um, the only thing I want you to understand in terms of how it works is you can think of it as taking like one addition or multiplication for numbers that you knew about um, and transforming it into like hundreds of multiplications or hundreds of additions that basically hide what the original numbers were. It's like super, super simple overview um, of how it works. And for how we could use that in machine learning, it's basically, you know, throwing the kitchen sink at the problem. So like, say I want to like, you know, do some machine learning on really sensitive data. I could just encrypt it. I could then do the machine learning and, you know, the people doing the machine learning or like the model itself has no idea what the real data was. And, but the machine learning will work basically. So even though they don't know what it is, it will work and give useful answers and only you who has the, you know, who has the keys to decrypt everything will get useful stuff back. Um, and so I think I'm gonna end it there. There's many more like, you know, uses of cryptography in ML that I'm sure hasn't even been thought of. It's there's constant publications, but I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm I'm running on time.